Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome. It's, it's absolutely fantastic to see a turnout. It's such a beautiful day. Thank you for coming inside. And um, um, we appreciate that. My name's Ross Virginia. I'm the director of the Institute of Arctic Studies here at Dartmouth. I'm also a member of the Environmental Studies Program. And today's uh, uh, lecture is sponsored by the Institute of Arctic Studies and the Eigert uh, Seminar Series on Dialogues in Polar Science and Society. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure to welcome back to Dartmouth Dr. John Hobby. Um, John is a distinguished senior scientist at the Marine Bi Biological Laboratory Ecosystem Center located in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. Um, he's internationally known for his research on the relationships between microbes, the little things that live in soils and lakes, and what they do in controlling nutrient cycling and productivity in ecosystems. Um, he's done this in a number of ways. He's developed some of the foundation techniques that are everyone in, in limnology today and microbiology know of and have used. But in pioneering these techniques, he developed a set of really fundamental and important questions, which has really has positioned him as one of the leading microbial ecologists in the world. Um, he received his undergraduate education right here at Dartmouth College. He's a member of the class of 1957. And 1957 was a very vibrant time. Um, it was the last, it was the third international polar year, all right? Um, Willemir Stephenson was at Dartmouth College. The Northern Studies program was one of the most popular majors on the campus. It's, we don't quite see it that way today, but that, that, was, that was a really great thing going on here at Dartmouth. And a lot of really prominent and important people that went to the North in different ways, scientists and politics and law, you name it, um, really came out of this period of, of Dartmouth's development. Um, uh, John sort of started this in, in 1957. He ended up in Greenland right, with a group of Dartmouth students measuring the thickness of ice on lakes in, in northern Greenland. And um, those of us who work in polar systems, at some point in our lives, we get what we call polar fever. And I don't know if that was it. Was that the start or did it come later? Just then. Right? Just, yeah. So John's had it for his entire career, obviously. He's gone on to spend most of his career trying to figure out how Arctic ecosystems work and how now they're responding to climate change. Um, he uh, started his work in Barrow, Alaska, but he quickly moved south a little bit to a place called Tulik Lake. And John really began to draw attention to this place scientifically from his research. And more and more people sort of came to Tulik Lake. And it's now really one of the best studied Arctic places in the world. And it's the site of the US main Arctic research station. Um, as part of that, John was a leader in uh, pulling together something called the Tulik Lake, the Arctic Tundra Long-Term Ecological Research Program. There's like 20 plus sites that are there to establish long-term ecological baseline information. And there's one in the tundra, and it's a Tulik Lake, and, and John has been principal <coughs> investigator on that project, and really a driving force in, in the, all of the research that's come out of there. Um, I think one of the special features of John's career is, is his impact on the development of ecosystem science as interdisciplinary science. Um, in, the, in the early 1980s, a group of people came together to found the Ecosystem Center at Woods Hole. And I think it was a, if I interpret the history correctly, it was a group of scientists who were really committed to intensive teamwork, interdisciplinary approaches, but they also felt that the kind of university structure was, might hold them back a little bit. And, the Ecosystem Center came to be one of these places where people came to focus on that in this, this very intensive collaborative research enterprise uh, formed by scientists for scientists. And to this day, that model still exists at the Ecosystem Center and is highly productive. Um, John's received many, many different honors from his peers in recognition of his research. Um, he received the 2008 Redfield Award for Distinguished Lifetime Achievement. Uh, by the American Society of Limnology and Oceanography. Um, the Odom Lifetime Achievement Award, the word Odom, if you're in ecosystems, that's, that's the gold standard. So any award with Odom on the front of it, I'm very excited about. And he's also uh, a fellow in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, John's worked 
throughout the world. It's not just the Arctic. He's worked in the Antarctic. He has a very strong research program in estuarine ecosystems. He's very interested in the coastal margin and, and the microbial processes there and human impacts. Um, but shortly after finishing up his graduate work, he went from Dartmouth, he went on to Berkeley and then Indiana University. John ended up far south in the Antarctic, in the Dry Valleys near McMurdo Station. Um, it took me 27 years after John to get to that same place. Um, I have polar fever and I still work in that area. John, I think, realized perhaps it wasn't quite green enough or biological enough or something or other, but he, he left the Dry Valleys and went north and has stayed up in the Arctic. Um, but um, the U.S. Uh, Advisory Committee, and one of the things that can happen in Antarctica is if you work there and you're lucky, you might have a geographic feature named after you. All right. So I went online to make sure I knew there had to be something named Hobby in Antarctica. So I went online and I found Hobby Ridge. All right. <laughs> Hobby Ridge. And this is the official citation. It says a bold ridge. It's not any ridge. It's a bold ridge. And I thought that was prophetic because I think it really sums up um, John's approach to, um, to his science, to the way he works with students and his colleagues, and really the impact that he's made on his field. So um, it's a real pleasure to have uh, John Hobby back to Dartmouth to talk about um, the Arctic and what's happening to the Arctic. The title of his talk is, Is Climate Change Threatening Alaska and Beyond? So please join me in a very warm welcome for John Hobby. Thank you, my boy. Thank you. All right, let's make sure the sound's on. Are we happy? Uh, thank you very much, Ross and the Dartmouth community here. Uh, the last time I got paid by Dartmouth to do anything, uh, 1958. And I was a graduate student at Berkeley, and there was the Dartmouth Expedition and USGS, and they're going to um, Alaska where I could do some, some uh, thesis research. That was great. And they said, I'm, I, let me say again, I was a graduate student. I had no money whatsoever. And Dartmouth, in their kindness, said, yes, and we'll pay you when you get back. <laughs> so I, I, I looked around for friends, and there was a, a, a very attractive blonde who was also at the practice studio. I was taking cello, and she was a pianist. Uh, and she was a school teacher, just gotten a job, $3,900 a year. Boy, that was, that was money. And so I borrowed $250 from her, kept in touch, paid her back, and married her into the next year. <laughs> so that was a good Anyway, I hope Dartmouth has, has evolved. From I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, the general, some changes that have been going on in Alaska just as a result of, of the temperature change. And certainly, there has been a temperature change. Here we see the annual temperature for, throughout the whole state and has gone up. Uh, it's gone up to, to this point, it's gone up um, two and a half degrees or so Fahrenheit. And uh, because this is a general talk, I try to make it Fahrenheit. And, uh, and the, the projection then, we see 5 to 13 Fahrenheit change increase by the end of the century. It's big. Now, I point out. Alaska here has areas of continuous permafrost up in the north, discontinuous and sporadic permafrost down here. And I'll tell you more than you want to hear about permafrost, because that's a really important part of the picture. And here are some of the places I'm talking about. Prudhoe Bay, where the oil company is here. Uh, Barrow, um, up at the tip. Fairbanks in the um, center of the state. Anchorage down here. And the Kenai Peninsula, this, this region here. Um, so I'm going to mention some of these some of these places. And on the North Slope, where I've done mo most of my work, the uh, Barrow is up at the top, flat co coastal plain, foothills, 
the Brooks Range, the mountains here, and we have a town of Dead Horse where the, where the uh, oil, where the oil is at Prudhoe Bay, uh, and the pipeline sort of follows this Sagamon Irktok River here uh, all the way down to Fairbanks. And, and so we can drive there, which is the real important, important point, and save lots of money. Uh, this part here is the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, about this part here going on down, down south. And of course, that they just celebrated its 50th, 50th year. You should get up there if you ever can. Fairbanks, frost-free days, um, increased by 50% over 100 years. Nice long record in, in uh, Fairbanks going back 1900. Certainly warming, but look at the variation from year to year. Number of frost-free days going, going up. Uh, it's very difficult to take an average if you just have short term. Here you can see a change over, over 100 years. But Snow cover at Barrow disappears two weeks earlier. Um, when I was doing a lot of work up there, we, we thought it was um, around, the, around the 15th of June, the snow cover. Well, I, we, I was there in the 70s. And, and now uh, snow cover disappears uh, as early as 24th May. So there is certainly a change. Again, a lot of variability. Uh, the ice is changing in the Arctic Ocean. And one of the big problems that the walrus has, in, instead of the young uh, with their mother going out on the ice flows, well, the ice flows are now tremendously far out. And the water is too deep out there for the walrus to eat on their bottom fauna. So, uh, so they are hauled out on the shores of northern. Alaska. So that's a new, a new thing to happen. I don't know whether they're going to be able to um, survive like that, because it's a long way to, to the nearest flow, to the nearest food sometimes. Um, there is a s slight change in the commercial marine species uh, in the uh, Bering Sea, et cetera, um, that it's moving north. but. They said it's uh, between 1982, 2006, it's moved 19 miles, the center of some of these po populations. Caribou haven't really shown too much change yet. This is the porcupine caribou herd and um, in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, so this is. Um, when they are on the coastal plain, and this is the foothills. Here, here's a picture I took in uh, 1958. The herd was right there, and it circled this whole lake. And I always thought before I went, well, it's easy to estimate how many caribou were in a herd. You just sort of take this many, and then see how many this many there are. And uh, so I don't know whether they're 10,000 or 30,000, but there are a lot of caribou there. And um, they would suddenly, a group of 1,000 or so would suddenly decide to swim across this lake for no good reason, and one or two might die. Um, th this particular group, you can see, I was just standing there. They, they were not afraid. A grizzly bear just walked through, had just gotten through walking through that. They sort of spread apart a little bit, and the grizzly bear just walked on through in this, <coughs> this midnight picture. The ice is changing. So one commercial difference is going to be that ships are going to be able to reliably move across the uh, northern sea route around Scandinavia, across, uh, across northern Russia and, and Siberia. That they can do it now with little help from an icebreaker or two. It's going to make a big difference um, if they can do it for, for a number of months. Well, on the North American side, there's a northeast pass, excuse me, northwest passage 
uh, that starts over here, uh, going up past Greenland and Baffin Island, and then goes around a couple different routes around uh, big uh, Victoria Island here, and then around Alaska uh, a couple years ago here in Tuktoyaktuk, there suddenly a, a, a Chinese ship showed up and everybody, uh, people got off and landed illegally, and then they got back on the ship and went off again. No one knows what they were doing there. Um, but that's not, the Northwest Passage is not really open, open yet or for a number of number of years. Here is the present, just go on the web, this is where the ice was in August, just, just a month ago, uh, which is, this is the time in August of the um, maximum drawback of the, of the ice. It, it completely uh, fills the Arctic Ocean the um, rest of the year in the summer it draws back. Well, here is sort of the mean conditions from 1979 to, to 2000, and we see that there's been a lot of drawback already. And the um, commercial northern sea route, it was pretty well open all this time. However, the Northwest Passage here has still some blockage places. It's going to take a while, a while more. This is just the extent showing a continual decre decrease in the, the extent. This is million square kilometers. And it, it's just going down, down, down. So it should be open uh, within, uh, within, within a few years. There was an interesting way of thinking about it. So this is more geography, sociology, asking the question, if you are in a settlement in the Arctic in November, how long does it take you to get to, to, the, nearest, to the nearest settlement, closest, the closest settlement to you? And this could be walking on a, on a, cr across a, a river, a snowmobile, ride on a frozen river or um, rail, permanent road, uh, shipping. So here is compared August, uh, excuse me, November in two years, November now versus November in 2045. The black areas is where you can't get there. <laughs> you can't get to their settlement at that time, at that time of year. Um, the ice is, is, hasn't frozen enough to to walk or, um, and here there's, there's no move, movement out in the Arctic Ocean. So part of the places, it's going to be darker even here. That means it's even more difficult. It takes many more hours. The hours here are listed between uh, one to three hours and, and, uh, you, and you just can't get there. So this dark area is now is a lot smaller for the ocean part, but we see some places it's picked up. Maybe uh, the internal rivers are, are not frozen yet, so, so you're really isolated, and that would be this dark, dark places here. <coughs> so, um, so these kind of changes are, are, are happen, happening. In some places it's good if you worry about transportation. Some places it's not so good, <coughs> the, the warming, the change in Nature Climate Change, which is a, <coughs> a journal. <coughs> so, so I'll show you a couple of pictures of ice. This is a, a uh, satellite, the MODIS satellite, in June of 2008. And I just labeled Barrow to show you where it is. And um, lots, of, uh, lots of ice, it's not a just a beautiful white sheet. It's broken up. It's moving around. Um, is that the time of year for 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 whales? I, I I can't remember June. Not not a whaling time. Um, here is 
farther along to the east from the Arctic uh, coast, Arctic National Wildlife re Refuge. And I just think that th these, uh, this is a very dynamic view of the ice movement out on the, in, in the shallow waters of the coast. And then we have the Arctic Coastal Plain. We have the Brooks Range here. Uh, and that was a time when, in fact, if you looked at, 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 at where the ice extent is, it would appear, oh, it should be lots of open water. Well, the wind was wrong. And, and obviously, if you're on a ship, you'd be in trouble right there. Glaciers are retreating in Alaska. They've been a retreating for a long time. Here is a, there are records from this site here, um, Glacier National Park, going back to 1794, when Captain Vancouver discovered the place. And the, the ice has retreated 60 miles or more. So that and the Muir Glacier is retreating quite rapidly. Pictures on the left. Pictures on the right are, are uh, small glaciers in the Brooks Range, 1958. And that was the IGY year. There was a station up there. I actually landed on an airplane up, up on that glacier in 1958. And 2002, there's been a lot. By 2002, there's been a lot of pullback glaciers retreating. Um, but not all Arctic glaciers are receding. And the contrast is between the total Arctic glacier volume here, which would include those other pictures, and then the Arctic glaciers in Europe that are actu actually increasing at this time. Spruce beetles, a spruce bark beetle in Alaska and in British Columbia, other places are having a ter 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 tremendous effect on th this resource. And it's in Alaska, it's, it's really their central and northern, it's really their own, only resource of, of, uh, of trees, forest. And so, um, two years, 72 to 85, contrasted um, 85 to 98, the spruce beetle out outbreaks. And these are um, millions of millions of acres here are being affected. I think the number was 4 million acres in the, in the state. Well, why did that happen, one might ask. And the uh, it would be nice if there were just a nice smoking gun, but it didn't work out like, like, like that. They, they, uh, people who've been studying this have, say, well, um, the insect is heat limited in, in the summer. So that now when it's growing and normally requires two years to complete its life cycle. Uh, when it's warmer, as it has been, then it reproduces in, in one year. So you can certainly get response faster. Uh, and so that is happening. But then if there are cold winters, two successive cold winters will reduce the sur survival by a lot. So that's another way that the spruce bark beetle is limited. Um, it doesn't have any outbreaks. So now we have warmer winters and warmer summers. So both these things are happening. Um, Because of the, the ice has drawn back in, in the summer, then if there are coastal storms, then in fact there's, there's the storms and the waves have a lot more open water to build up. And they can have a tremendously bad effect on the coastal villages. And here, um, this dark line here is the open water. And we see st in the recent years, in 1980 on, there's been a large increase in the number of storms, some these summer storms, when, when in fact they can be really um, destructive storms. <coughs> Erosion. 
And here is a, a village, Nutak, uh, and the Army Corps of Engineers is predicting that the, that the uh, coastal, co coastline is going to retreat hundreds of meters over, over the next 30 years, 20, 30 years. So it's really a big, a big change, a big effect. And we haven't even, haven't even talked about there would be an increase in the height of the, of the sea level. That will be coming more and more, too. Um, about fire, here it's been warmer and drier in some places. Well, these are places in Alaska where, in fact, the fire has been, this is a 56-year record. And we see it's in the central part of Alaska, out to the Seward Peninsula here. But there's practically nothing in the, in the Arctic. Fire has not been a problem at all. And, but the area burned is projected to triple under moderate greenhouse gas e emissions. So not only is, is this uh, losing the, the resource, the, the, the forest, but also there's a tremendous public health problem of, of, air, of air quality. I was in Fairbanks in 2005. You couldn't see more than, more than about, about 200 feet. It was really, really thick there, and it went on and on and on um, for, a number, for a number of months. So that's going to happen even, even more. The Arctic didn't have any. We, we said, oh, it's too, it's, it's, uh, too moist up there in the, in the tundra, and we don't have many lightning storms. Well, 2007. This happened. Uh, there was a, a dry spell, uh, two or three or four weeks, and there were a number of lightning, and there was a, a lightning storm. And there, 30 miles away, there was a large fire. Well, here is the fire in 16th of July, and then we see uh, clear weather, and two hours, three hours later, it clouded up. The, the smoke blew this way, and in September, it was, it was burning here. These are wimpy little fires, though. You could, couldn't even jump a river at all um, because the, the canopy, the forest there is, is a, a foot high. But there's a lot of, don't forget, there's a lot of carbon in the soil, tremendous amounts. And by 30th September, the fire was still burning these white dots are frozen lakes. So they, uh, it wasn't until the snow happened in, in early October that we finally got uh, put, the, put the fire out. Well, here was an opportunity to study this. There was so much burn, so intense burn on the soil. The soil here, we can see uh, a foot or more thick has tremendous amounts of organic carbon. And that amount there is total over the Arctic is equal to two times the total amount in the atmosphere of, of the world. Um, and here, the fire is so intense, it burned all the organic matter off and got down to the mineral soil. And it, it actually, iron at the mineral soil um, turned red and, and orange. It doesn't show up in this, with this <coughs> projector, but that was what was happening, the ox oxidation of this, of this um, iron. Well, Arctic vegetation here in Alaska is becoming more shrubby. How do they, people know? Well, there are some oil company exploration pictures from 1950 in the same scene uh, 50 years later. Now, it's not an overwhelming um, bit of evidence. If you look at any place, yes, there are, there are uh, um, it, it is a little bit denser, the, the shrubs there. Uh, but are these 
the same shrubs, just getting a little bit bigger or just what is happening. And so that, that's a very, still a very difficult question and, and people are still arguing. It's, state, it's sort of the state of the art discussion. And I point out that the willow, birch, and alder shrubs grow slowly anyway and they can live for over, over 100 years. So uh, a little bit of warming is not going to suddenly cause these things to just wilt. They, they actually would, would, would grow better. We, we wouldn't expect a really fast response to these uh, small changes that, that have been seen so far. And, but then the satellites came, in, came into being and uh, part of Alaska is green, we see up here, and part is brown. So th this is a cumulative, uh, well, it's actually showing what's happened with a greenness index that they can measure from a satellite. And we see up in this part, in fact, it's greener. It really is greener. Um, and here, it's, it's browner because of all the, all the fire and the drought that's been going on. So, um, so, so what has been measured really is the amount of reflectance of different wavelengths, and they put that into a formula and come out with a biomass. We can cali calibrate how many grams of carbon there are on a, on a meter square, squared. So it, it's a, it is a, a uh, integrating measurement. And of course, from satellite, you're not just measuring uh, a square meter, you're measuring many, many more square meters. So that's happening and going to continue. Um, is we don't know whether that's just more, more leaves or whether the whole plant is, uh, or more, more separate plants. So uh, that work is still under underway. Here's a picture of alders growing on the north slope. Isn't that a great picture? What it is, is polygonally patterned ground. And these are, the, we call these polygons, these little places where ponds have formed. There's a little bit of raised uh, outline. And that is because of permafrost, and that is because of a little height difference there, just a, a centimeter or two that allows this shrub to grow. This is a nitrogen fishing, fixing shrub anyway, so it gets a big, a big, uh, a big kick because it can, it can organize its own nitrogen. So I haven't mentioned permafrost yet, and yet it is the most important part of the whole of the whole picture here. So now we're going to have more. So you want to know about permafrost, frozen ground. That's simple. It isn't, uh, it can be ice, it can be a gravel pile, um, sand, it can be dry. And 22% of North America is underlain by permafrost. It's frozen ground under there. And, um, Here's where all this soil, is, the uh, carbon is. I mentioned the n big number here, um, 1,600 uh, petagrams, and that's what a petagram is, which is a billion metric tons. It's a big number, and that's about two times the total amount in the atmospheric pool, the carbon. So don't want that to get uh, warm and decompose and go off the of CO2. That would be bad. So what controls all this. Uh, I mentioned before that there's di continuous per permafrost, and that's up in the northern part of, of Alaska, discontinuous permafrost here, and then um, sporadic. Over in Siberia, there's a tremendous amount of continuous permafrost. The farther you go away from the Gulf Stream, the more um, permafrost that there is. Here's what it looks like on a tr transect starting up in Prudhoe Bay and going south. Uh, permafrost is uh, 1,800 feet thick there at, at Prudhoe Bay. And the active layer, the part that melts every summer, is, is 
not part of permafrost, but the active layer where all the roots and plants live. Uh, that uh, up there is uh, 20 to 35 inches thick. Okay. Then we get down south, uh, Fairbanks. We see here uh, 1 to 1.5 meters, um, uh, 60 meters. This is a um, discontinuous. So it's, it's, it's on the north facing slopes. It isn't on the south facing slopes. Uh, and then finally down in, in the Chickaloon, and my wife says, where is Chickaloon? So I looked it up. It's next to Wasilla. So now everybody knows where Wasilla is. You wouldn't have known that before. Right down near, not too far from Anchorage. And that's the uh, permafrost is getting pretty uh, discontinuous. And is, of course, that part is going to lose all its permafrost because it's really warm right at the melting point now of melting point of uh, water. There's an easy <coughs> metric here. They have six or eight deep boreholes drilled along, uh, along the road, along the pipeline road. And this is the farthest north one. They, people put, you put oil, fill this pipe this hole with oil uh, and measure down. We just drop a thermistor down and measure that. And this is what's happening at 65 feet where you don't see any annual change. It's down where the changes are long-term changes go going on. Okay? And we see a change from 17 uh, Fahrenheit. And now it's uh, uh, warmed up to 22 tw or 23. Well getting up there towards 32. So bad things happen when permafrost gets, gets warm up, up to the freezing point. There is a threshold there. And a lot of Alaska up on the North Slope is underlined by ice wedges. This is something you can see the results of ice wedges. You can't see ice wedges unless you hit something where there's been a, a part of Something fell off into the ocean, or uh, a road was, was built. And the ice wedges begin to form when the tundra really gets chilled during the winter. And there's a crack that forms. And this crack is just like cracks in, in, in a mud puddle or something due to drying. And they, they can form whole polygons that will be hundreds of feet across. And then water comes in the springtime and enters the cracks and freezes when it reaches the permafrost. So after 100 years or 1,000 years, you have a giant ice wedge underneath here that may be um, 10 feet across or so, 5 feet across. And it is, they're all connected in this network. And there's a little bit of an ice push ridge up above. So forms a very nice um, container for a little tundra pond. Okay? And uh, here is one picture. We already saw all those alder trees sitting on the little ice push ridges. Here is a ice wedge on a, on a, a uh, coastal small cliff, uh, Barter Island. And this white stuff is not the white cliffs of Dover type of thing. This is ice here along one edge of one of these giant polygons. And here it, it even has a nice ice wedge shaped shape. And so here, that's begun to melt. And this whole block has fallen off. So the erosion is not a gradual thing. This is something happens in a big storm. Near Barrow, the uh, the entire coastal plain is, is covered by old lakes. And on those old lakes, um, these little tundra ponds have formed due to the ice wedges. We see tre tre tremendous. Here, so here's an old pond. Here's an old lake. Here's an old lake here. Another big lake here. And thousands of ponds. We, we did research on 
some of these ponds um, one for, for three years back in the 70s. And here, here is one of our research. We had so many people trying to work on that pond that we had to put in, put in aerial tramway so they wouldn't tromp around and break up the, the, <laughs> the ecosystem. Um, people are going back there now. This year I was up there for a while advising a project that's making some of the same measurements again of the algae and the phosphorus and the, the growth of all these plants. So that's a picture from the uh, from 72. <coughs> this part up here is the active layer, 31 inches, where the roots, plant roots, can grow. And we see below that massive ice wedges. So the problem comes when when the ice wedges melt and the whole system collapses. And we, we see here is a picture of, of a person standing in here, hidden. And uh, the, the collapse of, of a boreal forest, probably in, in Siberia. In Fairbanks, giant, it melted out uh, just, just along the road. Some of these tree, trees where the, the permafrost has, has thawed, or the ice in the permafrost has thawed, and so it looks like a drunken forest. Here's a nice, a nice uh, house here in Fairbanks, or somewhere li like that, that they weren't too careful about where they sighted it, and there was ice underneath. And this is Chersky in Russia, or one of the Russian villages where, in, in fact, you'd think they would have known better. They haven't even lived there for a long time. But, but anyway, a big breakup. So there's a threshold here. And this is the Alaska highway map. Um, each dot is where the highways are. And these are all on village in, in towns and villages. This is the paved highway um, system, which is 4,900 miles. These are the only connected parts of the system. So there is no road net. There's just a, a very limited area. And uh, this area here is the part that's going to be affected by this permafrost. If, if the uh, permafrost and ice is under an a airfield, uh, a terrible, terrible problems. Under a road, terrible problems um, because of melting. There's a, a road at the University of Alaska, Fairbanks, campus where a road comes down to, to, to a main road from their bluff, and there was permafrost under there, so <coughs> it thaws a little bit, and then they put asphalt there, and it happens again, you put asphalt. 25 feet later, the things have stabilized, but they got 25 foot thick, thick uh, piece of asphalt sitting there, built up over the, over the years. And some of the costs estimated by uh, 2080 would be six to seven billion dollars for cost, future cost for publicly owned infrastructure. And here is a little scene where a, a road has uh, slumped. That's a big, big pothole. Some parts there's going to be ro uh, ponds and lakes being lost but not in the Arctic for the next 100 years because it's still cold and the, the ice is still cold, permafrost is still cold. When they built the oil pipeline, they had to keep 50% of it above ground, 50%. And they would much rather have put it all underground, much cheaper. But they, they were worried about where there was ice and a hot oil pipeline. 140 degrees centigrade, um, yeah, 140 centigrade, no, it's 120, 140 Fahrenheit um, would melt some of these holes, some of these ice, and some of this ice, and there would be collapse. So it's all above, 50% above ground. And in the Seward Peninsula, currently, it's sort of, excuse me, discontinuous, and then later this century, there will be only um, almost all 
the permafrost then will be uh, discontinuous, and a lot of areas there won't be any per permafrost. So what do scientists measure in all this? And I thought we'd just finish up by talking a little bit about what, what can be measured and the value of long-term ecological records and long-term experiments, because that's what the scientists have been doing there. <coughs> we started research at this one site on the North Slope in 1975, the year they opened the pipeline road. And so here is the pipeline road up here. That's the road, and that's the pipeline coming in. And uh, 135 miles south of Prudhoe, Prudhoe Bay. Um, so it's called Tulick Lake. And the field station is now run by the University of Alaska. Uh, we have up to 100 scientists there at one time. And the complete people change and come in for a week. Come people, people come in for the summer. So there's a lot of. Um, Different projects there are long-term ecological project is one, just one of these now, used to be the, the, the main one. Um, we have a, a website. If you want to find out what the temperature is right now, today, just go at the website and, and uh, find out that uh, th this is dates here, uh, about six or seven days worth, and um, temperature um, last Friday or something like that was was uh, right up right up at freezing, Not, and had some cold time here. Uh, lake temperature dropping, dropping, dropping. Lake probably froze um, again last week, and then solar radiation, etc. And here's the ad address. You can go and look at data till you're blue in the face. But with all this high tech and um, websites and everything, we haven't been able to demonstrate that the air temperature has changed in this, in this place. It certainly is changing from year to year to year, but to uh, try to figure out whether this is um, any trend or not, you need a lot more data. Our 25 years is just not enough. So that would be a direct measurement, and certainly is what we would expect to have happen over longer periods of time in all the climate models. Yes, it's going to happen over longer periods of time. And, but the ground is snow-free for two weeks longer now than in 1989. So we see this graph here. Yes, the growing season length is, is, is longer. That's one thing. Certainly, uh, we can count on that's happening. And one change that we can't argue with is an I integrating change, and that is a chemical change in the water, in the stream water and in, in the lake water. It, it's a change in the alkalinity of the water. And we are, in my opinion, this is a good proxy for increased permafrost thaw. Well, what that means is just at the bottom of the active layer, top of the permafrost, the permafrost there is, is in glacial till. It's been frozen there for 10,000 years, that glacial, um, uh, that, that, that till. And it has a lot of carbonates in the, in the soil. So, now there is some weathering going on, interaction between these carbonate minerals and, and water. And so the alkalinity, which is mainly carbonate, is showing up in the, in the soil water. We don't know whether it's where it's happening. Is it happening just in the top few millimeters of the, of the former permafrost, or is it under, underneath some stream <coughs> places? We, we, we just don't know yet, but there's also some stable isotope changes. So, um, and th this amount of change is not anything that's going to affect plants or animals. It, it's a proxy of what is happening in the soil. 
So we have evidence of increased permafrost uh, thaw, but when we try to measure the thaw depth, go out there twice a year and measure a thousand points, well, it's a mess. It varies from year to year to year. There isn't any yet any any, any change, except up at Barrow, where it's a lot colder, the, these numbers um, would would be down down deeper. The the uh, there's less thaw there at Barrow. Okay. Um, set up a, a grid of, of uh, posts where had had measured exactly where they were, and every six years go out and do a a uh, survey looking at a single square meter here next to each one of these posts. And these posts they have 109 of these posts. Tremendously detailed work, and they measure here the shrubs, the grasses, the mosses, lichens, forbs. Um, it's, it's called a, a a point frame, and they put down little sticks and see where one one of these actually hits a plant. So they're looking at the same grid every six years, and here in uh, from the one from our tulip site. It, in fact, is getting more and shrubby, shrubbier and shrubbier, higher and higher biomass um, over, over time of the shrubs. Grasses, well, as things are fall here was an in increase and now a decrease. Um, mosses are, are way down. So we have records here from 1990, 96, 2000 to 2008. Tremendous laborious work of trying to figure out what's happening. Where is this change happening? And what are the implications for the, for the future? Long-term record, here's nitrate in, the, in our nearby river. And we see a big change from two, excuse me, 2002, 2005, uh, 2005 is the blue. That concentrations are higher than they were back in the, back in the 70s. And the, uh, and the 90s. So we have records like that. We don't know why this change is happening. It certainly is happening, and it's a very important one, runoff of nutrients. Finally, we actually go out there and change the environment. We do experiments with these systems. And what do we change? Well, here we're changing nutrients, temperature. These little greenhouses are for changing temperature. They come down in the fall. The dark ones, that's shading light. That's 50% of the light taken off. Um, change the pH, put, put um, little wire fences there to keep out the caribou and the mice and everything that's eating the tundra. And do the similar changes with lakes and streams. Uh, added nutrients, take away fish. We begin to get an idea of the processes that are controlling these systems. Why aren't there more fish? Why aren't there more um, uh, plants? Why isn't there better plant growth? We can test a lot of this. And here is, for example, one of these greenhouses. And on, on the left, we see the birch in the warming and fertilized experiment. Those birch used to be one, feet high, one foot high, and now they're about four feet high. Uh, and in that's warming plus fertilizer. Fertilizer. They're actually up, up, uh, up, up six feet high. And in just the warming alone experiment, on on the right, they aren't up that high. They're only up two and a half to three feet. They've responded probably through the microbes breaking down more organic matter in the soil, providing more nitrogen. That's the kind of experiments that we can do. And certainly tundra does respond. Here is the birch responding uh, without any heating. And the birch responds so well that, in fact, pretty soon, after a number of years, started out in 82, 
they have grown so much that they've completely shaded out everything else in the plot. So that the experiment sort of ends. And do experiments, weeding, take, leaving only certain species. How do species interact? And in streams, there had been a drip of phosphoric acid in this river um, since 1982. And the river the, the, was dominated by sort of a little bit of um, diatom growth on rocks. That's what makes rocks slippery if you're trying to walk, it, walk in the river. And here, the mosses have taken over. So we had tremendous growth of mosses. We didn't even see them before. They were certainly there, but we didn't even notice them. Uh, you're about to give up the whole experiment. And uh, after nine years, then all of a sudden, this, this uh, gigantic change happened, and the whole river is changed, at least for that half a mile or so where there's enough phosphorus. Finally, talking a little bit about a fire. And I mentioned lightning strikes on the north slope. Here is what this particular storm looked like. BLM is able to record the location and occurrence of every lightning strike in the whole state. And so they know where to look for the fires. Not that they do anything about them, but they know where to look for them. Uh, and the strikes have increased 10 times since 19 since 2000. Why is that? Because of more uh, open water and more um, storms, as, as we saw, moving, moving through the system. And so we had one big fire. I've already mentioned a picture here from the satellite. Well, um, the burn, here's a severe burn, and here's a moderate burn and unburned tundra. We are looking here at the amount of carbon dioxide coming off the system, a very sophisticated flux measurement. And how much soil and carbon, soil plant carbon was lost? A lot. Two of these teragrams, which is a billion kilograms of carbon, was lost. Uh, in this one fire, which is 1,000 kilometers squared. But the whole tundra, well, that, that, that's growing better, uh, perhaps. Uh, isn't it putting, socking away some of this carbon in, in, this, in the sequestration? Well, that complete uh, change here of more carbon was for this whole r big river basin was only 0.2 of these. Teragrams. So uh, this little area was two teragrams lost. This whole area was um, 0.2 teragrams, uh, was socked away, sequestered. Well, so it, it's a very important process for changing the tundra, and it's happening faster and faster and faster, we think. Finally, the interactions here, this doesn't just happen at Tulick Lake or this region and the ocean, we, we see more melting of the sea ice and more radiation is absorbed. The uh, ocean is, is warmed and more melting of sea ice. So it's a nice uh, feedback here. Uh, on the land, the higher the vegetation grows faster, more shrubs, more radiation absorbed earlier snow melt, and we see, again, positive feedback. All this Arctic warming goes faster and faster, and the global warming um, also is a part of, 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 the whole, of the whole here, but it's probably happening faster in the Arctic than any other place. Just to summarize some of these things going to happen in the future, ocean ice, 50 years, ice-free Arctic Ocean. Northwest Passage and Northern Sea Route will be open. Climate can continue to moderate, growing season lengthen. Precipitation increased by 38%. Maybe that's the most doubtful um, 
projection there. It's very difficult to get. The models don't even get the present precipitation right. And uh, here we're talking about what's happening at the end of the century. Fire, more frequency, we think. Permafrost dis disappears for most of Alaska, but it's stable on the, on the north slope. And uh, we mentioned the damage, road and airfield, but not on the north slope. Uh, more erosion and thermofrost, coastal erosion, much as 200 meters over the next century. And lakes and ponds, some will disappear. Vegetation, better dredge, grass and sedge growth, but dwarf birch and alder will spread. Caribou don't seem to like dwarf birch, so that might be a, a there's a lot of resin in these <coughs> leaves and branches, so that could be bad. Uh, fish, some are, are not going to survive, it's too warm. Large mammals, uh, more roads, development, and more hunters and other disturbance. Takeaway message is just three points here. Changes are very slow in the Arctic, despite warming air temperatures. Plants are long lived. Changes will occur, species abundance, and not by species replacement. There's no sign of that. Permafrost, tremendously important in shaping the ecology of the tundra. It affects the drainage. Uh, the water stays up in the upper parts of the, of, of, of the soil. So it's a moist tundra. And yet, I didn't mention that, in fact, the total precipitation is more like a desert. Uh, and it will be a century or more before the thawing threshold is reached in the Arctic. Finally. <coughs> a good way uh, to understand what's happening and make projections to the future uh, by, is by experimental manipulations of nutrients, heat, and species, a valuable tool for ecological prediction. So thank you for your attention. We have time for a few questions. And we're recording this, so please. Uh, Use one of our microphones here if you have a question to ask. Very nice, John. You've done a great job since you graduated with our <laughs> class. Listen, I wanted to, uh, shortly after you graduated, you did some research in Greenland with ice cores and things of that type. Did you end up um, identifying any other serious climatic changes in the past that uh, were of this type of magnitude in terms of duration and intensity? Well, I, our type of research that we're doing could not answer that question. We, we were more interested in, in um, lakes this was the this was a Cold War, so we were working out of out of Thule. We wanted to know if those fighters and and bombers with atomic bombs could actually land on an Arctic lake as, as an emergency landing strip. So that was Dartmouth's contribution, <laughs> uh, and the answer was no. It's just it's still too rough. <laughs> You said that the depth of the permafrost hadn't changed, but that there was more um, carbonate in the waters. And so I'm just wondering if you're still deducing that that carbonate came from the permafrost well, in some way. It's just our lousy measurements of how thick the, the active layer is, how it changes. It's just when, when there are t tussocks on top, which is the growth form of a lot of these sedges, and the, the, um, the, the thickness of the, of the, so you're measuring along this transect, and, and you hit, you put an uh, iron rod down, and you hit, hit ice, you hit the permafrost. And so then you're going along, and it's that way, and then you're under a tussock, and bang, the tussock has insulated things. And then next to it, or maybe next to it, it's back down, or something else happened. There was a, a, a snow, a little snow bank there. So it's just so variable trying to get good data, find data on, 
on that kind of measurement. So, so it's our so it's our measurement, not whether or not it's happening. So that's why the chemistry was a more of an integrating um, measurement. It measured something happening over a much larger area. The fires are really spooky. Um, wh what are what are thoughts about recovery from areas like that where you've burned down to the mineral soil? What, what are the predictions? Well, I, I I don't know because in fact I'm not a fire ecologist, and this, the, the fire and its recovery has been a major major effort <coughs> in the interior. Well, Alaska, but as you say, see, not on the on the North Slope. Uh, certainly, a moderate burn. The the tussocks, you think they're all dead, but bang! Within weeks, they've started to spark to sprout again. So uh, strong recovery, but how long it takes to build up that organic soil again? Um, I'm sure, there are other people who would talk about it uh, better, and people at the University of Alaska Fairbanks has been some. Big, big projects about burns, but not in the Arctic. Yeah. Um, a couple of years ago, um, okay, a couple of years ago, I attended an international Arctic Year conference here, and I remember a fellow standing up near the end of one talk that uh, may have been in this room, um, and he looked very grim, and he discussed the fact that well, when the waters open up, there will be international disputes over resources. And what level of international cooperation is there, is there up there to preserve the environment? International cooperation. Um, let's see, I can tell you about the Antarctic for a long time. <laughs> um, well, that's, but as far as anything across governments, um, there's certainly cooperation of, of, of uh, scientists and projects sharing data, but um, right now the, the argument, because the U.S. never signed the law of the sea, right? So the, the next step, I think, is that other, other countries are making their claims, and there was a limit of when they had to end making claims, and that's already passed now, and the U.S. still has, has, has not signed the law of the sea. Why have they not signed it? Um, we don't sign treaties. <laughs> environmental treaties. May I ask one other question about the Arctic Coastal Plain, the last 90 miles, and it's still preserved, the last undeveloped 90 miles next to Canada? Do you, what's the potential for oil drilling to stay out of that section? <laughs> Depends who wins the election, I, I think, in part, because uh, that's part, part of that just up uh, right, near, right near the ocean is where this barrel arch um, system, geological system that they think contains the, the oil. But they haven't done any, any, any drilling in that region, so they can't really say whether that's true or not. Um, so I don't, I don't really know what the, what, what the chances are, rather, but it's a, it is the last wilderness, and uh, certainly the setting up Anwar, the, Wildlife Refuge was a tremendous um, victory for conservation in the United States 50 years ago. And certainly hope that uh, some of that, that country is, is, not, is not changed. But when that does happen, then there's all sorts of movement of, of grizzly bears and wolves flocked into that area. Uh, it, it's not just a little patch where the drilling might, might be, and they're much better at drilling now than it used to be in terms of area, but then you've got a road and the hunters, and they, uh, pretty soon the state takes it over and become available for all, all sorts of, of people. There are less than 1,000 people that move, that go into that area now, a year.
Um, do you have any uh, favorite possible explanations for the increasing nitrates in the streams? Well, yeah, it's a good question. I, mean, uh, I said we didn't know, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> atmospheric deposition is not a question up there. Yeah. There is practically none, and uh, so, so it's so it's not not atmospheric deposition. Um, the, the soil is warmer, and, and, and we see that when we warm the soil, we do get more um, nitrogen available, but as shown by the growth of these nitrogen-limited shrubs. So that sort of logic would say the nitrogen cycle is being enhanced. Things are happening faster. That's a question for you to do research. Well, I, I think that, that John is a great example of valuable liberal education, at least the way we are for the floor. All right. All this is going to accomplish. We're going to claim much of it. I think it's <laughs> earthly. <laughs> <laughs>